a waste product that I'm sure everyone's familiar with. Um, and, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the waste reduction hierarchy, uh, you know, you want to reduce the amount of, of waste product coming into your life. It's hard maybe if you really like a beer or wine. Um, but uh, the next is to reuse. Uh, and lastly would be recycle, of course. So by making glass bottle bricks, which uh, we have an example of one here. It was previously laid. Um, we cut off the tops and we recycle them. So that's the bottom choice of the hierarchy. I mean, obviously above throwing it away in the, in the rubbish. Uh, but we reuse the other part, the other half of the bottle, two bottles, uh, taping them together to make a bottle brick. Mm. So um, whenever you're working with a, uh, any material in building, um, uh, or, uh, whatever you're doing with it, you really want to understand the, um, the properties of that material. So glass, in its pure form, is, is clear. And that's why uh, it, it's, str it's stronger, it's more crystalline structure when it's clear. So that's why you can have really thin milk bottles, for instance, uh, they're clear. Um, or as the opposite end of the spectrum is champagne bottles, really full of pigment, have to be quite chunky and thick because they're simply not, it's not as strong uh, when it's got loads of pigment added into the glass. Uh, so uh, I learned the hard way when I was doing magpie recycling. Uh, we had to collect nine materials on uh, milk floats converted for the task, uh, electric milk floats. And um, you know we have a, a, a finite storage for each material. And uh, if we didn't smash the glass as we went, we would just fill the whole truck up with, with glass alone, glass bottles alone on a round. So uh, you know, when you smash a clear glass, it kind of explodes. And when you smash colored glass, it more crumbles. Uh, uh, then explodes uh, as you're shattering it. Uh, so um, this uh, there's a lot of ways to cut your glass bottle bricks, but um, this device here is a wet tile cutter, and it's by far the most efficient method uh, to manufacture your glass bottle bricks. There are I'll go a little bit more into that in a second. There are a couple other ways um, uh, to do it. Like you can you can simply wrap a bare copper wire connected to a battery around the bottle at the place you want it to break uh, and then heat it up the glass and then dunk it in cool water, tap, and it usually shears off around the heated and cooled band where the copper wire was. Similarly, uh, you can use uh, some cords soaked in paraffin uh, and again tie it around that point, light it, dunk it, and, and tap it. It shears off. You get about uh, at least 20% loss with it breaking in the wrong place and stuff. But it is a simple way to do it, not using electricity or what have you, um, in terms of like, um, you know, plugged into the mains kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, this is a wet tile cutter. It's made, doesn't have teeth, uh, and, it and, it, and it's a diamond encrusted metal blade. Um, so it's, uh, and it spins through a, a water reservoir down here. And the reason that is, is because like tiles, glass is really hard, and if you, didn't have the blade being cooled, the diamonds on the blade would get burned down quickly and your blade would go blunt very quickly. Uh, so if you use a handheld grinder to cut glass, it'll shatter the glass, it gets so hot as well. So you need it to be, the blade to be cooled uh, as it's spinning. Now these devices are, um, they're, they're really common, a DIY tool that um, people will Actually, you know, you can leave it off just for one more second, and then I'll and then I'll, I'll flag you to turn it on. Um, it's a common DIY tool that basically people will like. You know, want to retile their bathroom, they'll buy one of these things, and then it'll sit in the attic for ages. And you can pick them up really cheap, is what I mean. They they, they often get sold at bar boot fairs, things like that, or at the dump. Uh, the thing about them is that they're they're pretty much all created equal. They have a similar spec motor. They all have a blade that can be replaced. Um, that's simply metal uh, with you know diamonds encrusted so I'm gonna put this bottle here I'm gonna make sure uh, is everyone listening it's this important part of it because you're gonna be doing this in a sec I'm gonna make sure that it's it's square to this uh, this guide so we've got a 90 degree angle there the blades gonna be spinning I'm gonna put the cowl just to about above the height of where the bottle is uh, I'm gonna then start pushing the bottle into the blade and the blade's going to be spinning toward me and I'm only going to be pushing the bottle in until it's where it's cutting through the thickness of the glass, like in a little bit further. I am not going to be pushing the bottle all the way in like this. I'm only going to push it so far 
until I can see that the blade is cutting through the thickness of glass, and then I'm going to be rotating the bottle toward me. Now, th this is a minor detail, and I've seen it done both ways, but just for extra safety, uh, if you ever are working with a tool with a spinning cutting blade, uh, and you, like a, a handheld grinder, you always cut, the grinder blade is spinning like this, and you always cut back towards yourself because otherwise it wants to kind of run away. Uh, so, so similarly here, with the, with the blade spinning towards me, if I go this way, it's kind of going with the, and it wants to get momentum and maybe spin out of my hands. I, it's, it's very unlikely, I'm just saying it's a minor detail that helps add another level of safety. So I'll be spinning it toward me. So, okay. a little bit to the left. <laughs> okay, now I deliberately did that rapidly just to show you how safe it is uh, and that you can do it quickly. Don't go quickly if you're uncomfortable. Go at your own speed, it's okay, uh, we have time. Uh, the other thing is that I mentioned about the properties of glass. I'm cutting clear glass here, so it's, it, 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 it cuts through it a lot easier. If I was cutting, I mean, I'm sorry, colored glass. If I was cutting clear glass, I would just go a little bit slower, just because it's harder, and you just want to give the blade plenty of time to, to do its thing. Now, uh, another thing, I don't know if you all noticed, but at the last, I, um, it, it seemed to cut through and the top came free because there was just a little tiny bit of glass still holding it together. Now that, that kind of breaks off before it actually cuts. So there's a last little sweep into the blade just to cut off what would have been a little burr or tooth uh, sticking up where the last bit of glass was connecting the top to the bottom. So just do that last little sweep even after the tops come free. And, I, and there's a recycling bin down here that I just throw it through the tops in. Right, so now I've got my two halves, a bucket of water down here. I just dunked them in it a couple times just to get the glass dust out. Okay, so we've got two clean half bottle bricks, half the half bricks there. Uh, I'm using Misha's old trousers here to um, to uh, dry them off. Of course, you can keep the gloves on here if you like. I'm being careful about my my fingers not getting rubbed against the edge of the bottle. Uh, by having the cloth plenty around my fingers. <coughs> Just drying them off like this. Now if you were doing this at your home or you want to make a, do a glass bottle brick wall, why not air dry them? If you just manufacture a bunch, air dry them. We're speeding the process today so that you can all do your bricks and get them laid in, in, in an hour and a half, two hour period. So. We're mainly wanting the outside to be dry, where the tape is going to be joining them together. So this is just gaffer tape, duct tape. Pull myself off a piece. I think it's easiest if you just lay it down, then lay one half, then the other. Make sure they're touching. Okay, and voila, you have a brick. So <laughs> if I had left that burr on there, it would be like a banana shape, you know, so it wouldn't be what we wanted. We want it to be just straight across everywhere, okay? this one, these two we've just done, uh, it'll be a dark green light. 
But if you do, if you do a light, a clear on one side and a light green on the other, there, it's more of a light green, even both ways, uh, because the two pigments mix. Uh, and if you if you found yourself some red glass bottles and some blue glass bottles, you'd like have purple lights. You know, it'd be really cool. So you can do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, Maybe a bit more. What I've got here is a um, uh, like a stud framework, a wooden structure that you might. It's an example of what could be in your house. Yeah. So you've got the wooden stud walls. They're called, you know, with uh, just the timbers making up your wall before you plaster it or whatever you're going to do. Um, and here I chose just to. This is just. This is not. Ha doesn't have to be the way you do it. Uh, but but this is just showing some example of of different things you can do. So these timbers that make up the square that we're going to be filling in are 17 <coughs> centimeters. That's why we're cutting our bottles to the same length, so that our wall is evenly thick, the whole all over it. However, these uh, this plus sign of wood is 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 uh, is only four by two, so ten centimeter uh, wood. So the reason I did that was just to show an example of of different ways you can play around with your design. Um, so ultimately, these, this plus sign of wood that the structure that separates the four segments of this square uh, will be rendered over, so it won't be visible. Equally, you could have decided, I want the wood to be visible, and I like a grid pattern of wood with infilled windows along it. And you could have used the same dimension as the main framework. Yeah? My idea was also that uh, because I've seen some really beautiful bottle walls that also combine mosaic work, uh, that I would disguise the fact that there was a structure inside by bring, sweeping mosaic in and out uh, of that center with little tiles set in and things like that. And maybe make an artistic pattern of it uh, in that way. So just to give you an idea of just some things you could, you could play around with. How big can your sections be for them to be stable? Like, what's the limit of the... Uh, so, so, glass bottle bricks are not a load-bearing wall. So, a load-bearing wall is like the tire walls or a timber framework that, not that hold up the roof. Yeah. Uh, but bottle bricks do not hold, hold up the roof. They're partition walls, okay? okay? So, they divide or section out your house. And that's because, uh, like, you know, bricks have a shape that means they knit together, they're flat and they stack and they're, and they're laid uh, staggered so that they have, even if you didn't put mortar, you could stack it up and it would be a pretty strong, uh, you know, structure. You could probably push it over, but, but you know, it's pretty strong. Whereas a stack of logs, if you don't have stakes in the ground, the logs just want to, you know, go flat. Bottles are the same shape, aren't they? So if you just put bottles up, they would all just want to like roll flat uh, from gravity. So two things there. One is that with the bricks, you lay them with uh, only a centimeter of mortar because again their shape is, has some integrity to it whereas bottles don't uh, so we need to have a really thick mortar join uh, which is this joining of, of the bottles together and that's going to be at least one inch 25 millimeters uh, one to two inches now the, the bigger your wall is or the higher it goes I would, I would suggest that you need to expand that that mortar join appropriately. So if you're going really high uh, without it in a single pane uh, you would you would maybe do a three inch mortar join or more depending how high you're going. You see? So it's an equation of, of you know the needed strength for the size of the aperture you're filling. The same with how often do you put your timber? Or yeah, uh, no, the timber you could actually just do a wall that was without the timber. But I just wanted to give an example of something that you have a house that's timber frame and you're infilling uh, with bottle bricks instead of plasterboarding and plastering the wall. So this is what I'm giving an example of. So, so what's the purpose of this one? That it sounds like narrow it. This piece of yeah. uh, the purpose I chose for this was I, I divided it into four because I, I normally teach two uh, practical sections on an earthship course and I wanted the first group to do this 
and the next group to do that. And then we do a pointing layer. I'll explain that next. Quite loud, isn't it? <laughs> um, okay, so another thing, if everyone comes closer as well, because I, I'm having trouble shouting over the, the, the sounds, uh, the generator and the bottle thing as well. Um, so you notice, I've protected the wood with plastic, okay? That's a good practice. I've also, I've put nails in this at different angles. I've, it's what's called porcupining. Okay, and the reason for that is so that, because no matter how good your mix is, uh, you learned yesterday with Misha, I believe it was Misha teaching yesterday about uh, shrinkage and strength when you're making a cob mix. So you've got clay on its own is extremely hard when it dries, but it shrinks the most, just pure clay. Sa a, a too sandy mix won't shrink at all, but you can crush it easily in your hands, yeah? So if you have too much aggregate mixed in, it's not very strong, but it doesn't shrink. If you have too much clay, it shrinks too much and cracking will form and things like that. So even with a really good mix, which traditionally is a, every bit of clay in the ground is different shapes and stuff, but uh, it's 25% clay, 75% aggregate is the normal uh, recipe for a good strong mix that doesn't shrink too much and is really strong. Nonetheless, there will be shrinking. So if this... What proportion again, sir? Uh, one part clay to three parts aggregate. 25%, 75%. Yeah? So, so this panel will have shrunk a tiny bit. And then, if you imagine, it's a big square in, a, in an aperture. If I didn't do the porcupining, I'd be able to push that out of there. Uh, most, you know, it could, it could possibly come out. So the porcupining of these nails simply means that once it goes hard, you can't push it out. It's, it's, it's keyed in and locked in by the mortar around those nails on the edges. So you would preferably get a big wall to put those in anyway? Yeah, 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 I'd say. If you were doing one big aperture, uh, you'd put bigger porcupining on the edges, big nails, four inch nails, you know, increase the scope of what I've shown here in a small scale of everything. So you have to like work proportionally. They're a way of using a waste material, less carb, and like in the bathroom, you get light but no visibility through into our, our toilet and bathroom, so it's a nice use in that case. It's also a beautiful feature, sunlight streaming through a stained glass in essence. And people do mosaic uh, work but also do like drawings in a way. What, what I'm saying is it more of an attractive thing rather than a just clay. Right, yeah. Adobe wall is like the back of the earth shape wall. Yeah. It's a normal looking flat wall. So you can still, it still, it still work without the bottom. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah, cob houses are built, their walls are this thick, you know, but they're, uh, they're, they're made out of just this mix. Yeah. The same mix you guys established what was the right recipe for that particular clay rich soil that we use, okay? I just want to make that really clear. When you dig in the ground, there's maybe clay, maybe no clay, it could be almost pure clay, but it almost always has an amount of aggregate in it. Even when it's shiny, when you slice it with the shovel, it's got a bit of aggregate usually, a tiny bit maybe. Uh, but you've got to figure out what the balance is. I don't know how much Misha went into yesterday. Did you guys talk about this? A little bit. A little bit? So just real quick, did he talk about the jar test? Yes. Yeah. So that's how you find the percentage of clay in the soil that you're digging up. The top bit, you said. Yeah. The top, yeah, because clay on a microscopic level is tiny platelets of granite actually uh, and they rise to the top of the slurry mixture that you've made and they settle there and that's why you, and then the, the aggregate lumps fall to the bottom and you can then measure how, how much, say it's three inches of material and the top inch is clay, you've got 33% clay. Oh. So you need to add a bit of aggregate. So this is called adobe wall. It, what is adobe? Adobe is an Ameri a Native American term, I think, or okay. a Mexican term, maybe, of the same kind of thing. In England, they call it cob. Cob, oh, okay. This is cob. Cob has straw mixed in it. Uh, so uh, adobe is an American term? I th uh, yeah, oh, okay. a Native American term or Central American term. Uh, yeah, like yeah. This, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it, you know, in a really dry climate, it works brilliantly. Uh, in a wet climate, you've got to really do some extra architectural features to make it last a long time. But it's been used in, in England loads, yeah.
Okay, so one of the beautiful things about using a natural material is that this barrow is filled with the mortar from the last course that's just been chiseled away, put into the barrow. And I'm gonna add some water here. You might wanna watch the microphone. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna mix this up a little more. So uh, anybody who's feeling strong, start shoveling that and mixing it um, together. And we just use the same material again. <laughs> So, so we've broken off the old lumps. We, I've chiseled them up with a shovel, you know, broken them down, added some water gradually. We've added some more. We're just going to get it mixed in there. I mean, one of the ways, once, um, I forget your name, sorry. Nadine. Nadine is doing some of this mixing. We can actually grab some of the material. Uh, we we want to slice it with the shovel to kind of break up any lumps. But this, once we get it back into a nice consistency, is going to be our mortar for the next for the work we're about to do. And so you can't do that with cement. Cement, once it goes hard, you have to throw it away and or crush it down into an aggregate for other use. Uh, so yeah, we need just that, that to be, there's another shovel there, maybe speed the process a little bit. Sorry, so, uh, No, you just always want to make sure that you've got at least an inch between them for a small wall like this. Uh, and bigger, the bigger your wall gets. Yeah. So let's have a, um, it's pretty wet at this end. It's yeah, dry. let's try and mix it more and, and make sure there's none of this. Uh, I know it's, it's tough, but we could add a bit more water. If like. I just don't want it to be too sloppy. The more wet it gets, really you want it as just wet enough, but if it gets too wet, you can only work maybe one or two courses before it starts squishing, the weight of itself starts squishing out. And then the problem there is that you end up with some some issues where maybe it's gone, this is like just on, I'd say that's more like 22 millimeters, you know, it's just gone a bit under, maybe because it was too wet and people pushed it down too much. Aww. So you want it to be wet enough that you can form it around without breaking your bottle, squish it into place, but dry enough that it's not going to stop you working up a few courses at a time. That's another advantage to partitioning your wall, is that with wood, is that you can do this run, that run, that run, that run, say there was more up here. Whereas if I was just trying to do a single opening, like you were asking, you could you have to stop after about three, four courses, let it go hard, come back the next day, do again. So the advantage of the wood again is to have many runs going at once. And so you can speed your work. Really, what I'm going to teach you today is the skill, is the skill of learning how to make the front match the back. And it's just a few checks that you have to do and to make sure it's plumb. The term plumb, does everyone know what that is? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. No, okay. Plumb means completely ver vertical. Oh, okay. Like if you were to hang a string with a weight, yeah. gravity will, finally it will start to hang exactly plumb. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you want your wall to be. Because if your wall starts going like this, it wants to fall over, doesn't it? So you want it to go straight up. Yeah. As if from the center of the earth, a line comes straight out into the universe. That's your plumb line. Yeah. yeah. That's looking good. Not too wet. What is the lady's hair of freezer at all? Good job. <laughs> That's a nice mix. I like it. That's really good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, what's your name again, my friend? Uh, Patrick. You, you can either use a trowel to scoop some of this out. It's really good for your skin. I like to use my hands with materials that are that are not caustic uh, because you get a better sense of what you're doing than using a trowel or a tool, but but you're welcome to use the, or have the gloves on, whatever you're happy with. I throw this in here so that it sticks onto those nails and stuff. Maybe a bit more. Okay. Make a nice bed. Maybe a bit more, just to make sure. <laughs> I can always rake some out. Now, the goal is that I want to lay the bottle and I want to have still left about an inch or about, well, about, yeah, 20, 15 or so millimeters proud, the bottle sticking out. That's my goal because what we're going to do is we're going to, next, after you've all laid your bottles, we're then going to start doing pointing, which is the final coat that doesn't have any straw in it that leaves a nice, smooth finish. Okay, so, so first we want to lay our bottle. We squish it in there. Now I'm holding both ends. Instead of putting pressure just here where the bottle could smash, I'm putting pressure more toward the ends, pushing it together this way. As I'm 
wiggling it into place. Then I take a straight edge, it could be a straight piece of timber, this, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting, making sure it's touching this bit of this wood and on the other end as well. And then I push my bottle to that edge. Now I know then, because my bottle is 17 centimeters long and this stud work is 17 centimeters thick wide, that my bottle is flush to both sides of the wall and it's gonna be, it's gonna, and I've already, I've already made sure my wall is plumb when I did my framework. So I don't have to check plumb line with each brick I'm laying. All I have to do is take a straight piece of timber or a straight edge like this level and put it to both two of the bits of stud work and then I know I'm getting a plumb line because I've plumbed my wood first, you see? If you're doing a garden wall, you have to be checking plumb as you go as well by using a level much in the way we were checking the, the tires to make sure that we had that one inch batter where you hold the level up like this and you look at the bubble there and make sure it's between the two. So if you're outdoors, you do a plumb line a different way than, than indoors with the stud work, okay? So that's the first thing I do, the first check. The next check, is by eye, I'm making sure that it's parallel to this line. Okay, just by eye. You have a, we, we have a good eye. You need to learn, you learn to trust your eye when you're doing work, building work and stuff, laying bricks and things. You gotta be able to trust your eye to a degree. So, so uh, I'm looking, that's about the same distance there and there. Uh, I might be a millimeter off, but to my eye, it looks pretty darn close. So that's one check, two, uh, second check. Then I lay my boat level, a really short level like this, and the bubble is more to this edge. So I need to tilt it forward just a bit, right? So now my bubble's right between the two lines exactly. I know then that the distance between here and here and here and here in the back are identical. Yeah? Does everyone understand that? Now that's the importance of that is, imagine if I didn't do this check side to side, making sure it's parallel to the edge or the bottle next to it, then it might be like this and the next bottle like this so I've made my one inch there, but look in the back, it's like six inches. Mm -hmm. So uh, also checking this way. If it's not, if it's not level, then it, it could be tilted this way or that, and the mortar joint in the front will be one inch, but in the back you might have two bottles touching. So you need to do these three checks, and that's how you do it. And, the, and then your wall will have the mirror image front and back. So if you don't need to keep running around back and forth and measuring or something like that, yeah. But your wall is curved and obviously the outside will have slightly more of a gap. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. when you do a curve but then... at least an inch on the inside. Yeah, the what you would then want to do is you want to have a... When you do a curve, you decide what it's going to be and you build... You cut wood to that curve. You, you have formwork that you then offer up and you lay oh, your... Yeah, yeah. And you would have a radius line yeah. on that formwork to help you get a consistent radius line yeah yeah so you'd have to you know there's there's obviously clever ways of sorting that kind of situation out but yeah, yeah. great okay Patrick how that is and you notice I left I left room for us to do the pointing later which reminds me this now if somebody doesn't mind uh, needs to be mixed up this is just the clay and sand mix we can add it uh, just start mixing it first maybe crushing Cut our bricks to the same width of the timber framework. Right? Yeah. Then, by eye, what um, your name again? Andy. Andy. What Andy did by eye when he laid his brick was he made sure that it was parallel. Yeah. So uh, you could have a tape measure or a little block of wood, right. and, and and but but then you know you want a little. I like a little more free form when I work, but but you could do it very precisely and methodically. Uh, and then the last check he did was this. Because that way we know that the distance here is, is and, and, and we don't end up with bottles touching in the back and uh, with the right gap in front kind of thing. So we have a mirror image. Okay. So now I'd say that you want to put some mortar in this corner and lay your bottle somewhere up here. So this is when it gets a little bit tricky because... You must layer it like the tires and the tire walls, so like... Yeah, you want them to be like this. Uh, you could do it differently, but you'll use end up using more mortar, I think. Uh, quite a bit, right? Yeah, and then just if you see his bottles getting, um, yeah, you want quite a bit because we're gonna and we're gonna need to go over. In fact, while we're doing this, uh, have you already laid yours? Yeah. Do you mind working from the other end and just put a little bit between so that when people and the nails are holding that panel in, because the mortar goes hard around it. Cut our 
bricks to the same width of the timber framework. Right? Yeah. Then by eye, what um, your name again? Andy. Andy. What Andy did by eye when he laid his brick was he made sure that it was parallel. Yeah. So uh, you could have a tape measure or a little block of wood, right. and, and and but but then you know you want a little. I like a little more free form when I work, but but you could do it very precisely and methodically. Uh, and then the last check he did was this. Because that way we know that the distance here is, is and, and, and we don't end up with bottles touching in the back and uh, with the right gap in front kind of thing. So we have a mirror image. Okay. So now I'd say that you want to put some mortar in this corner and lay your bottle somewhere up here. So this is when it gets a little bit tricky because... You almost layer it like the tires and the tire walls. So like yeah, you want them to be like this. Uh, you could do it differently, but you'll use end up using more mortar, I think. Uh, quite a bit, right? Yeah, and then just if you see his bottles getting, um, yeah, you want quite a bit because we're gonna and we're gonna need to go over. In fact, while we're doing this, uh, have you already laid yours? Yeah. Do you mind working from the other end and just put a little bit between so that when people? Another really cool thing you can do is you can uh, put saran wrap uh, cling film around your bottles, top and both ends and then lay them with the cling film on the bottles and then uh, and then when you come back you can roller paint the wall instead of having to cut in you can have a really garish kind of colors between the, the mortar you know between the bottles and then you just simply cut it out or and then burn I don't throw it hard, but I did give it a, a bit of a, a throw just to get it to really go into all the all the cavities. Now here it's important I don't go this patting patting because then I'll be drawing the moisture like I was describing from the back of the mix to the surface, which would make it all runny, and the back would start getting dry and not stick to what's behind it. Okay, so I, I push it in there. This is rendering. This is kind <laughs> of like rendering, but uh, rendering is like on a flat wall with no bricks. So you, you smear a whole layer across the whole wall. The difference between rendering and pointing is that pointing is like rendering, but it's the, it's filling the gaps between. Often, uh, you'll look, you'll, people will advertise that they need a builder to come along and repoint the brickwork, where it's kind of worn away from the weather, and there's cra and there's and, there, and it's starting to fall out and stuff, and you have the bricks. Uh, there's a bit of a recess between them. They still have mortar in there joining them, but it's kind of falling out and you have some problems there, maybe cracks and things. So a builder will come along and grind out or chisel out all back about 10 to 15 millimeters from the front and then he'll, he'll, he'll trowel in a new mix so that all the, the mortar is apparently flush with all the brick face. Mm. So it's just a, repar a reparation job that you can do um, to, to extend the life of your brick wall. So, I'm just doing some here. I'll do a little bit more. So I missed the beginning bit. The stuff that you're putting on, is it the same stuff that we were using yesterday on the uh, tire wall? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, without straw in it. Without straw in it, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I would have trimmed this plastic back. I'm just, um, uh, I should do that one day, but here we go. Uh, so I've got, <laughs> I've got um, my stuff in place there. Now, Whenever, you know, gravity will uh, work against you if you start going pushing down. So I just kind of, I'm just pressing and rubbing up maybe a little bit. I won't, I won't rub downwards because if I rub downwards, it starts pulling away from the bottle like that. So I wanna, again, I'm not patting, I'm just kind of pressing. You can see, that's what you want your wall to end up looking like. You don't want to have all this straw and stuff sticking out. So if you see any bits, you can just pull, pull them out as you work. The best way to get your straw to length so that you don't have all these long bits is to take a strimmer with a wire attachment in a gorilla bucket, just a big plastic bucket, put your straw in there and just like a blender. Oh. And you just, you just basically <laughs> blend the straw into short, <laughs> chop it into shorter lengths. Um, but you can see, and this is really nice, uh, this mix, I think, because we've used sharp sand, which when you go to a building merchant, you can buy building sand. There's lots of different grades of sand, but sharp sand has larger lumps of stone aggregate that are like a couple millimeters big in size. 
and uh, when we imagine you can see even just using this sponge it starts to shine up those and if you at the end you oil it or something like that the shininess of those little flecks of stone adds a really beautiful feature to a wall equally if you didn't like that you just want it to be a like, matte color you know kind of thing don't use uh, building sand normal uh, sand. If you that, want to do mosaic on it at what point? After, after this point? Stay yeah, on. yeah. Uh, I would say that you needed to stick them in as you're going. As you go, <coughs> Yeah. I'm actually, to be honest, I think uh, even better, you would, um, it would be a bit of a task. You'd have to leave a recess around uh, and then use uh, a tile adhesive. Because I think they might just fall out of just this. Mm -hmm. um, I've never done it, actually. It's just an idea and something I've seen people do. Mm -hmm. But it would be a tricky task, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but you can do it. Yeah. And if you're building your own home, it's a, people tend to put like such amazing amounts of labor into it because they want their, they're living that home the rest of their life. And yeah. it's accessible. You can do it. You, know? Not, you don't have to hire somebody. Yeah. You can do it. You know? So you just like, take your time. You might do this for a section and then say, if I wanted to put some mosaic in, I would just carve out, maybe with a little metal tool, the the places where I want the mosaic tiles to go. Say I wanted to want it to go everywhere in here. So I would do the whole thing like this and then afterwards carve it out before it's gone completely dry and hard. Um, There's one way you could do it. You Again, over here, render it all, but then in here, lay it, you know, recess your, your pointing back a bit so that so that then you come back and add the thickness of the, the mosaic pieces and stuff like that.